Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming to the Sydney Sussex um, student life question and answer session as part of the Cambridge Open Days. We're really pleased to welcome you along to, to this session this morning, uh, this afternoon, um, and very sorry that we can't uh, welcome you in person. Um, so in this session, we've got uh, two events coming up. Uh, the first hour between now and four o'clock, we're going to be talking to a bunch of our wonderful Sydney undergrads, uh, and you'll be able to ask them all of your questions. And then at four o'clock, we're going to have another Q&A panel with some of our arts, humanities and social sciences directors of studies. If you do want to um, join the session and then leave and come back or whatever, uh, you are able to do so with the Zoom links you have. So feel free to come and go if you need to. Um, and in order to interact with us, you'll be able to um, ask all of the questions you would like via the Q&A function, which you'll be able to find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there is also a chat function, but only use that if you have any like messages for us uh, that aren't questions. For questions, stick them in the Q&A box. Um, we will answer them um, uh, as they come, but if, if your question doesn't get answered straight away, don't feel you have to ask it again. We will get to it eventually, I promise. But do feel free to start putting those in now and uh, we will get to them. So uh, it's also worth pointing out this session is being recorded, um, but no one in the audience, uh, none of your names or questions or anything like that will be uh, visible to anyone. Uh, and you can answer your, ask your questions anonymously if you need to. Right, so that is about all in terms of housekeeping. I think we can get going. So I should probably introduce myself. I haven't done that yet. Um, my name is Dr. Stuart Palmer. I am the school's liaison officer at Sydney Sussex College. Uh, so I go around schools, talk to teachers, talk to parents, talk to students like yourselves um, about Cambridge, about university, about everything really. Um, and I also work with loads of um, great undergraduates um, to, uh, to, to do these things. Um, and I also teach in history here at Cambridge as well. I'm a historian uh, by training as well. So that's me. Uh, let's move on to our students. Uh, shall we start with Beck, if you'd like to just introduce? Yep, so I'm Beck, and I've just finished my third year of linguistics at Sydney and I'm from Middlesbrough. Um, hi, I'm Emma. I'm a second year studying maths at Sydney and I'm from Bromley, which is in South East London. Hi, I'm Laurie. I'm a first year studying history and I live in Norfolk. Hi guys, I'm Oyen. I'm a second year lawyer um, and I'm from Watford. Hi, I'm Ruby. I'm in first year studying history and I'm from Bradford. Cool, thanks guys. Um, so we've already got quite a few questions come in, which is fab. Um, there are a couple of difficult ones, which I might say for later. Uh, as, a, as an opening question, I think a really common one we get, uh, and something that I think your opinions would be really useful on, is how did you pick your college? Um, the whole point of the open days, right, is to, to help us pick where you're going to apply. So maybe some of your experiences on, on this would be really useful. Um, does anyone want to, to sort of start us off with that? Yeah, Emma, go. Okay, so I'm not saying you should pick your college like I did, um, but if you want to know how I picked my college, um, I'm a math student, so what I did is spreadsheet. I decided all the things that were important to me in a college, and I ranked all the colleges on them out of 10, and then came up with a weighted point system. Um, and then, but all I really used that for was just to kind of make a short list. Um, and after that, um, I didn't go to an open day, but I went on a math open day. And so I spent the afternoon there just like going up to random colleges and asking the porters if I could have a look around. Um, so you might not be able to do that, um, but I don't know. It was more that um, Sydney in the end, I think it came second on my point system, but I chose it just because like wandering around these random colleges. Sydney was the one where one of the fellows just came up to me and said, hello, are you a prospective student? Do you want me to uh, take you on a little tour and show you around? Um, and so I picked Sydney because it felt really friendly and I 
think that's true. Yeah. Excellent. Does anyone else have any experiences they want to share? Um, I can add, add my experience if you'd like me to. Um, so I'd taken part in the shadowing scheme, which I don't know if that's able to happen or not with COVID. Um, but I was able to kind of get a feel for what Sydney was like. And like Emma said, I realised that it was a very friendly college. Um, but there'll be lots of things that you could read online about different colleges. And I think one thing to think about for me was location. So I wanted to be in kind of a central college, maybe a smaller college. So things like that, you could think about where the location of the college is, how large the college is, the sorts of things that you think you might like. Ruby? Um, yeah, I actually found Sydney Sussex accidentally on the open day. I just took a random turn and ended up there. So, and it just sort of stood out to me how friendly it was. And I just thought it was the right size. It's not really big. It's just quite a nice small college. And yeah, I just really enjoyed it. It was quite a nice coincidence. I stumbled upon it. Nice. Um, so, yeah, Sydney is one of those colleges that you do kind of just stumble upon. Uh, it's kind of, if you walk past it, you probably wouldn't know it was even there. Uh, it's right in the middle of town, but yeah easy to miss that leads us on to actually a question that's come in quite linked to that but um what are the benefits of a smaller college compared to a bigger college uh does anyone have any thoughts on that it's a tricky one um but what are the benefits in being in a smaller college like sydney laurie um i'd say one of the big differences with a smaller college like sydney is that with most subjects anyway you know your year group really well and so like Ruby, for example, I'm in all my seminars with, and we have like history, like trips to the pub or whatever. And there's that kind of communality that maybe you do get with a bigger college. I wouldn't know, having never gone to one, but if you're in like a big subject group and you go to Trinity, I can't imagine you stumble across everyone all the time and you don't have the same kind of community feel. And I think that transcends just your subject as well, I'd say. Everyone knows everyone in Sydney in any given year. And even the older years, you feel like you know really well, just because you spend your entire life with the same small amount of people. Good. Any other thoughts on that? Or maybe any downsides to it? So we're all, uh, go on back. I can't actually think of any downsides. I was just going to kind of echo what Laurie had already said. I think the fact that you get to know everybody, it's quite a, a homely feel and Sydney is known for being a very friendly college. So I think I personally enjoyed being in a smaller college, but I haven't had any experience of being in a larger college. So I think it's down to the individual, what you prefer. Go for it, Emma. Yeah, just to add that I think some people, um, I guess if you went to a smaller college, they might worry that they might not find their friends. Like if there's a larger college, then there are like a, perhaps a wider variety of people to talk to. But personally, I don't think Sydney's like small enough that that's an issue. I think even though it's one of the smaller colleges, there's still lots of people um, and enough to everyone to find their friends. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and uh, there was an addendum to that question about is it a benefit to be really close to the city centre? Um, um, I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of nodding, uh, but if, maybe if there are any, are there any downsides to it? Like, what are the good? What's good about Sydney's location? Let's go for that, Emma. Well, I mean, the first downside that came into my head is how easy it is to go to Sainsbury's um, because, like, that is very convenient. You know, if you wake up in the morning and you realise that you you can just like go to Sainsbury's and get some more with your cereal still in the bowl and it doesn't matter um but that does also mean you might go to Sainsbury's more often than is perhaps good for you um <laughs> yeah um and I think I really like being close to town um because you know if I don't have much time and I need to do something in town it's much easier if you don't have a long walk to deal with um but I guess a disadvantage of that is that if you're someone who doesn't fit much exercise into your daily life um maybe that's something like I know I have to think about making sure I go 
every day because I don't get much exercise going into town. Nice. Thanks, Emma. Um, okay, so moving on, the class, the eternal question of accommodation has come up. So we've got people from a whole range of year groups here, which is probably quite useful, but how would you describe your accommodation at Sydney? Um, and how do things like laundry work? Um, do you have your access to a kitchen? Like, do you have an oven? Like, so let's talk a bit about that. So do we want to start with uh, Beck as a third year? Do you want to talk about, about that? And then we can go so backwards in years. Uh, um, so in third year, you do tend to go for more of an, an old room in college. You don't necessarily have to, but it's just that, so it's a ballot system, which is how you choose your accommodation, which is basically just a randomly ordered list, which kind of flips around in the second year um, um, of you choosing which rooms that you want. So the room that I was in, in my third year was quite an old room. Um, it had a bathroom shared between two rooms. Um, the kitchen facilities weren't great compared to other years, but I think that's kind of what you find with Sydney accommodation. Some accommodation has really good kitchens. Mine just this year was with it being in an older part of college. And um, we just had a George Foreman and um, a microwave. But I think generally the Sydney accommodation is very nice. Um, and obviously it's very central, which I really liked. Excellent. Any other, anything to add to that from anyone else? Ruby, do you want to go? Um, I was in Cromwell Court. Um, first year, you just assigned accommodation randomly. And I know people might be a bit worried about that, but all the accommodation is still nice. And so mine was actually... It's just a two minute, three minute walk down the road and it's still very central and it's all freshers and that it's organised into flats of four and you share a bathroom and a shower. And then our flat actually had an oven, but I don't think all of the flats do, but it's still pretty manageable. And if you like eating in the hall like me, it's not really an issue. Quinn, anything to add? Yeah, I was going to say, um, so in first year, I lived in Garden Court, so I was quite lucky because um, the floor below me had like a, a full size kitchen. So, yeah, it's very much dependent on where you um, go. And like this year, I only, I had a gyp, so I only had a, um, um, a microwave and I didn't, and a George Foreman. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it yeah, it, it very much depends where you are. And um, there's also like that the, the um, opportunity to have an ensuite if you live in um, like Blundell or um, I can't remember the other block off the top of my head. So that's an option in second and third year as well. Thanks, Ryan. Emma? Oh, yeah, just to add that with the kitchen thing, like because in second and third year, you get a bit of choice about where um, you can choose to go somewhere with better kitchens if that's something that's important to you like me um there's some uh, another accommodation based question someone's asked um does does sydney have its own gym uh and how's the wi-fi i can't answer either of those because i don't use either facility but does anyone have experience with either the gym or the wi-fi I mean, I know there is a gym. Sydney does have a gym, a pretty well, a uh, pretty well stocked gym. Um, and I'm sure that what has anyone had any problems with the Wi-Fi? Beck, go for it. Um, there are Ethernet sockets, which I personally haven't used, but I know that people have. I just wouldn't know how to use them. I think in all of the rooms. So if you do have problems with the Wi-Fi, there is always the Ethernet connection that you can use. But in general, the Wi-Fi has been fine for me. I don't know if it's been the same for everybody else. No one's unmuted and said, uh, Oyen, sorry, put your hand up. I was going to say, maybe I'm just a bit cursed because <laughs> first and second year, it really, yeah, the bad wife, I really followed me. <laughs> so for me, it was pretty bad. But like, for most people, it's not, it's more than fine, I would say. Um, good. Okay. Um, so uh, Ruby mentioned eating in hall. And there has been a question about food. So should we just quickly pause on that? Um, how would you guys sum up the, the, the food situation in college? Um, where do you eat? Can you get a hold of things like uh, halal or vegan meals? Like what, what are people, people's experiences here? 
Laurie, go for it. Um, the food in college, at risk of throwing us under the bus, can be a bit hit or miss sometimes, but more often than not, it's really good, I think, anyway. We have um, meat-free Mondays as well, so that's always good for veggie just because it gives them a mix, but every other day there is always at least one veggie option. Um, Gluten-free is also accommodated. Um, uh, the guy in charge of catering, Steve, I think he is, he's really easy to talk to. You can just shoot him an email and say, you know, for whatever reason I need this, I need gluten-free. Um, are there any other vegan options available or I'm allergic to this or that? And he'll he'll make something for you like on any given day or for any given meal. Go for it, Emma. I mean, yeah, just to say we've had a kitchen project happening at the moment that I think is just finishing up. Um, so the kitchens have been a little bit restricted recently and haven't done as much variety as they might do from October. So I don't really know what things will be like in the future, but I think it's good so far. So, yeah. Cool. And I just realised um, we didn't cover the laundry question. How do you guys do your laundry? And how much does it cost if you do do it in, in college? Go for it, Beck. Um, so there is a laundry room. I'm not too sure how it works in Cromwell. Maybe Ruby might have to add to that one. But if you are um, on site, there is a laundry room. So basically you top up a little card and I think it's £2.20 per wash and maybe £1 something to dry. Um, so you can go in and use that whenever you'd like to. You don't need to book a slot or anything. You just go down and scan your card. Go for it, Ruby. Um, yeah, there is a um, a washing machine and a dryer in Cromwell Court, so it's not too bad. It's usually free when I've gone, but I guess I'm just lucky. Nice. Um, cool. Okay, so going back a bit, someone's asked a question um, about were any of you guys pooled. So this is going back to the, the idea of how did you pick your college? So is there anyone here that didn't pick Sydney and was pulled and brought in? And if so, how has that affected anything? Go for it, Owen. Yeah, so I was pulled. Um, I chose for a very superficial reason. I just wanted an ensuite, I'll be so honest. So um, I just chose, I, I chose Jesus because I, I'm pretty sure they have like guaranteed ensuites for every year. Um, but in terms of coming to Sydney I've not like found any problems at all and I've really enjoyed coming to Sydney and I think that's how it is for any like it, where, wherever you get pulled you'll very much find your home in the college that you go to in the end um so yeah um I have no sort of qualms with coming to Sydney it's a really lovely college I think in general like quite a few people seem to get pulled here uh like to every college but I think most most students that go through the pool end up loving the college they're at right um, I don't think I've ever asked an undergrad which is the best college and they haven't said their own one. Um, people just tend up. Um, okay, so moving on to sort of some social life things. Um, someone's asked a question about work-life balance. Um, so we can start there and move on. So the question is, do you have to work all the time and what kind of things can you do to relax and make friends? Who wants to start us off there? Go for it, Laurie. I think one of the perhaps downsides of Cambridge is that it's quite hard to switch off because you've always got some work to be doing. And more often than not, if you're not doing work, your best mates are because they're revising for an exam or they're doing their say that's due in that night or whatever. But it, it also comes with the advantage that because everyone isn't switching off, you can do work and be social often at the same time. So like in East Term, for example, people spend yeah, you know, most people spend the entire day just in the gardens working at a bench with all their mates or working with their supervision partners or whatever. So it's quite easy to socialise while keeping your head in the game, so to speak. But um, I don't know, for me, I always found it easier to have quite a restrictive like schedule almost and just say, I'll wake up, I'll not do any work until about midday and then I'll do like a block of work until like 5 a.m i just won't see anyone at all and then at about five i'll just shut off and say well that's done i can have a break now and 
just stop thinking about it until tomorrow or whatever. But obviously it depends on how much work you've got on any given day. Certain days of the week might be a lot busier. For, like for me, generally Mondays and Tuesdays, I'd be doing maybe as many as eight hours. That might be pushing it. But then I'd also have some days where I completely just do absolutely nothing because I did my essay the night before and now I've got about six days free without any actual deadlines. Emma? Yeah, I mean, just speaking on behalf of my patient habits, um, I think you don't have to work all the time. Um, <laughs> if I look at how it's work I had to do. Um, yes, it is a lot of work, but I also think that, um, like Laurie said, everyone has a lot of work. And so there's kind of like a understanding that you can still be really good friends with someone and as often as you might in other colleges and then when you get to not other colleges but other universities um and then like when you get to the end of term you can just spend loads of time doing together yeah nice um does anyone have anything in particular to say about societies what societies do people take part in what's on offer in the college um is there anything that we can can discuss here Ruby, do you want to start us off? Um, in the first two terms, I didn't really join any societies apart from the history one. If you study history at Sydney, you automatically become a part of their society. Um, but I joined in Easter term, which is the third term, um, Sydney's mixed netball team. And it's very relaxed. You can just play games whenever you're free. I think, I think it's on the weekends. In Easter term, it was just on Sundays, and you also play games against other colleges, so it's quite a nice social thing as well. Cool. Oyen? Um, so I do societies, but sort of outside the um, college, because I, I think I saw a question about how active are the societies, um, specifically music and drama. So um, this year, actually, I did what I... Um, took part in one like performance with the uh, drama society um, with the university so they are they are very very active there's always um, a show either at the ADC theatre or like the corpus playroom there's there's something always going on and it's always something to get involved in um, and also do dance as well so um, those two are very very active societies um, but yeah thanks that's really helpful uh, Emma yeah, I mean, I'm a big societies person because um, I'm a procrastinator, so I like to have my social activities like planned because then it's fine. It's, I, I, can, I can allow myself to go to planned activities because that's not putting something else off. Um, <laughs> so I do a lot of societies with the like university as a whole. So I'm in the Scout and Guide Club and with the University Cayley Band. Um, and yeah, there are lots and lots of societies and there's a big societies fair at the start of autumn term um, and yeah so many things you could get involved with. Cool, Beck, did you slow? Yes, um, so I was quite involved with student journalism both writing and illustrating um, and also I was quite inspired by the film Pitch Perfect and really wanted to be in an a cappella band but can't really sing so there were lots of different options so I was just part of the Sydney Singers just a college-based pop choir really um, but if you wanted to take things more seriously, there are kind of uni-wide um, bands and things like that that you can take part in. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like a daunting experience applying to something. You can just take a more relaxed route if you don't want to commit to something properly. Brilliant. Thank you, Beck. Um, there was a question in the uh, sort of on the back of this about how you find societies. And Emma mentioned there uh, um, the, the, the fair at the start of term. Uh, where all of the societies uh, sort of vie for your email address, trying to get you to, to sign up for, for that. Um, and I think that's pretty standard. Uh, most unis have something like that at the start of start of the academic year. You can go along to like a Freshers' Fair style thing where every society will be trying to get you to, to sign up. Um, Beck, Emma, anything to, to, to add to that? You've got a hand up. They've got like a society's direct page, um, which is run by the Students' Union and Essentially, because of COVID this year, the Freshers' Fair was basically 
the directory um, and you could go through and chat to people. But um, at any time, you can go onto the Student Union page and have a look through all the different societies that are registered with the Student Union and there'll be like a contact there. Thank you, and that's really useful. Um, nice, so yeah, lots of societies. What else is there in college in terms of like facilities for socializing? Um, is there anything, any other places that people meet? Uh, Laurie, go for, that was a quick hand. Um, yeah, one thing I'm really involved in is the student bar, which is one of Sydney's other claims to fame, because we're, as of now, I think we're the only still student run student bar in Cambridge. So that means that, um, the manager and um, people like me who are on the committee, we basically single-handedly run it ourselves. We pay for the stock and then we organise the prices and we just liaise with college as to how it works. And th that's great on both fronts. And you can work there, you can pick up a bit of money and you have just a nice tidy £9 an hour pocket money for just basically hanging out with people while pouring them drinks, basically. And in the same vein, you can just rock up any day. It's always open. And it's a nice communal space to have, to just hang out with just Sydney people and just, um, I'd say meet people. It's been difficult now in a COVID year because obviously you've got to, you know, you've got to book a table. You've got to sit on a bench with, you know, formerly a household, but you know, now just six people and they're outside. But in general, it should be a nice place to meet people when we're actually in the actual bar, which hopefully by October we will be. Yes, fingers crossed, everything will be back in October. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, here's a, here's a sort of good question. We've, been, we've talked about social life and work-life balance, um, but we've had a question about what does a typical day look like um, for, for you guys? Does anyone want to give us an insight into <laughs> the, the life of a, a Cambridge undergrad? Or we should probably have a couple of examples here. Should we start with the first year? Uh, and then what does a typical Day look. I go for it, Ruby. Um, so usually in a week I have to do one supervision essay and I'll try and read six or seven, eight things in preparation for that essay. And I try not to work all the time. I value my sleep, so I don't work very late. And usually I don't work till after lunchtime. So I promise I do do work but I try to keep a nice balance. Um, I'll probably spend a few hours each day reading stuff and just try and spread my essay out evenly so I'm not just cramming it last minute. I can still do fun things outside of work. Brilliant, thank you, Ruby. Emma, go for it. Sure, okay. So, I mean, there's kind of a difference between like, COVID years and non-COVID years but it, it's not too different um so normally in if I was being good right in the morning I'd uh watch two lectures so could in a non-COVID year they'd be two lectures in person um but with COVID years uh recorded lectures online um we watch two lectures in the morning have a bit of lunch um and in the afternoon maybe I'd do a bit of work but I'd probably just be like laundry go for a walk um, and then not laundry every day, but whatever other task needs doing. Um, and then I find some friends to eat dinner with. Um, and then I tend to do most of my supervision work in the evenings. Um, so I'll have two example sheets to do in a week. So it's kind of around four hours work a day for supervision. If I was going to spread it out evenly, then I'll do that in the evening and then maybe chill for a bit, watch a bit of Netflix and then go to bed. Thanks, guys. I mean, while we're on this topic, we've had a few questions that kind of relate to it about where's your teaching done? So like the questions are um, how often do you have to leave campus to uh, to study to, for your teaching and also how much socialising is done between colleges? So does anyone want to talk about either of those topics? Beck, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, so in non-COVID times, my lectures would be on the Sidgwick site, which is maybe like a 10, 15 minute walk. I mean, you could do it faster if you walk quickly or if you cycle, but I am quite a, I have a leisurely stroll. Um, so, yeah, you would tend to do that for me maybe two or three times a week. But obviously now things seem to be online. 
um, you do get to make friends at your lectures from different colleges, but also again through societies and things that would be how you would meet people from different colleges. Anyone got any other anything to add to that? Laurie? With um, subjects like history, um, a lot of our stuff, especially in this COVID year, has been kept almost entirely within college. So like two out of my three supervisors have been college fellows. It's all organized by your director of studies who's within the college. And I think that's quite nice about the college system that everything work-related can, although it, it never entirely is, but it can be entirely done within a hundred yards of where you live, which is quite nice. You've got the Sydney Library, which obviously is books for everything. And the, the librarians, very generous with if you need a book he'll buy it for you and then the library will have it for whoever needs it next so you obviously with some subjects you do need to go to Sidgwick a lot more um, for instance if you go into the university library or if you go into lectures but for history especially with lectures being online you don't need to leave whatsoever in theory which does come with the downside of never meeting anyone from other colleges through work but uh, Emma anything to add yeah, I mean, uh, your lectures were in like the centre of town, so that was like walk. Um, and then supervision. Um, at the moment, they're on Zoom, but sometimes they're in person. Um, and so most of my supervis supervisors, like first year, were based in college, so those would be just in fellows' offices around college. Um, but I know at some other colleges, and in later years, when you start specialising more, the supervisors might be at other colleges or they might have offices in the math department, which is like a 25 minute walk. Um, so I'll probably need to get a bike for third year. <laughs> I think it's fair to say if you've got a bike, you can pretty much get anywhere in Cambridge in about 15 minutes. There's, there's, there's not many places that are further away than that, right? Would we agree? Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, most, most people I think either walk or cycle around Cambridge. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, if, in a normal year, would you say that a lot of socialising is done between colleges? I mean, Beck might be the only one that can really uh, confidently ask, answer that one. But Yeah, so my supervisions tended to be with people from different colleges. My lectures were obviously meeting people from different colleges and then going to different societies. So I think kind of this year and the year before, there'd been a lot of socialising within college, which is also nice. Um, but in normal times, I would say that there is there is some socialising between colleges as well. Emma, got your hand. I think it can also depend what kind of person you are. Um, I know that there are, I know lots of people who, all their close friends are in college and maybe they've said hello to one or two people at their lectures or their lab. Um, but then I know other people um, who are heavily involved with some society or other and like all of their friends are through that society um, and maybe, They'll say hello to people on their floor, but uh, a lot of their friends, people that they meet at lectures or in their societies. I think it, you can choose which one works better for you. Brilliant. Um, this question's been here since the start, and I've been holding it back because I quite like it, and I don't really know how you're going to answer it. So, so uh, have fun with it. But how would you describe the general vibe of Sydney Sussex? And that could take us into a few other things. But does anyone want to start us off on the general vibe? of Sydney Sussex. <laughs> Go for a bag. I just think the thing that comes up when you speak to most people from Sydney is just a very friendly vibe. Um, I think with it being a smaller college, you kind of get to know everybody. Everyone seems really friendly, really polite. Everyone will say hello as you walk past. So I think that's the best way that I could describe it. Um, and then obviously the other plus is that we're right near Sainsbury. So that contributes to the positive vibes, I think. <laughs> Any other vibes? Anyone got anything different to add? No, I mean, I would say very similar. I've only been here since last year and uh, almost from the start, it was suspiciously friendly. Everyone was just, was just a bit too nice. I mean, they're very nice, Everyone's, it's a very friendly place. Um, but yes, uh, cool, okay, good. Um, so moving on to that, um, there's been a question about what's the, I mean, what's the college's relationship between state and grammar schools? So I suppose we can we can interpret that like 
how do people mix in the college? Is there a divide between, say, state school students, private school students? Like, is, has anyone got any experiences with that um, that we want to talk about? Beck. I'm happy to answer this. So I went to a state school in the north and my friends at Sydney went to all different kinds of schools, some private schools, some grammar schools, some state schools. And I know before I got to Cambridge, I was really worried that there would be some kind of divide, but I can honestly say that I haven't witnessed that at all and that it really doesn't matter what kind of school that you've come from. Everybody just gets on with everybody. Excellent. Anyone, anything else to add to that? Anyone? Laurie? No, I think, I think it, you know, maybe it is something people notice with certain people, but obviously it's, there's so much nuance in between different schools. You can go to a grammar school that's a bit hopeless and you can go for a comprehensive school that based on where it is and how much funding it gets, it's actually much better than those other grammar schools. So it doesn't, I feel like it might be something you notice with certain individuals, but it's not really, it never matters. Like I went to, I went to just a simple comprehensive school, but a lot of my friends here went to like really, really elite schools. And they're the types of people who ask when you get here, they ask, oh, what did school did you go to? Because I just assume that they'd have heard of it because they all went to Eaton or Charterhouse. But they're the loveliest people I've met out of everyone, <laughs> almost contradictorily. So you really don't notice it with people, even if you might notice it with institutions behind that. It, everyone is lovely wherever they're from. Emma? Yeah, I mean, just to say, like, I haven't ever, like, looked at someone and thought, oh, they're from a state school. Like, there's there's no kind of that. The one thing there is, maybe, is, like, some people were really, really posh. Um, and it all it ever becomes is just, like, a little bit of banter with your friends. Like, it's not ever, it's not ever, like, a divide. It's just, like, maybe laughing at someone's posh accent every now and then. But it's all a big joke and we're all in all friends. Yeah. I suppose at the end of the day, no matter which school, where you've come from, what your background is, you're all Cambridge students at this point. So again, those things really matter. That's one of the nice things about university, really. It is a great leveler in loads of ways. Um, brilliant. OK. Um, there's been a question about mental health support, um, both in college uh, and in the wider university and other colleges. Um, so we can, I mean, we can talk about uh, mental health support, but also should we talk about sort of study support at the same time? So um, does anyone want to talk about the, the support that they get from college or anything like that? Whether it's academic, mental health, social, anything, like what kind of support structures are there? Go for it, Beck. Um, so I think there's a few different people that you could approach. So if you have a problem kind of academically, you could go to your DOS if it was something subject related. So that's your director of studies. Um, or you could also approach your tutor for things like that, or if you have more like personal matters that you want to discuss. Um, and at Sydney, there's also a really good pastoral team. Um, so you could speak to the nurse, there's different members. So there's always lots of different people that you could approach if you feel like you have a problem. Yeah, um, thank you, Beck. Um, does anyone want to talk about what tutors do? Because I don't. I think you know that's something that not necessarily um, people are aware of before they come to Cambridge. I certainly never heard of uh, the, the the concept of having uh, like an academic tutor. So does anyone want to give a really basic explanation of how that works or the supervision system? Anything? Go for it, Emma. Um, well, you kind of have like two people in college who are like assigned to you for the property so you have your director of studies and you have your tutor and your director of studies is for more like academic matters so they might they'll organize your supervisions um and if you're trying to work out what courses you want to take or something or if you're struggling with a particular topic that's the person you can talk to um and then you also have your tutor who is there for more personal matters and um, kind of i think had a meeting maybe like at the start of term and at the end of term and you can also talk to them anytime and they can help you with like finance stuff and how you're settling into uni and all sorts of things like that um but there's also other support so like with the students union um like the college jcr the uh, students union people um they have welfare reps um the kind of person who would rather go to like 
are no students and stuff and they have I think the welfare reps there are really good. Brilliant, thank you Emma. Now that we've mentioned the, the JCR, does anyone want to explain what the JCR is? And is anyone here on the JCR? <laughs> Go for it, Oyen was there first. So, well, I was on the JCR last year, so I was the um, Black and Minority Ethnics um, Officer. Um, so, effectively, the JCR is just like a collection of students representing sort of like in different areas. Um, and like you have your, your accommodation officer, welfare officer, BME officer, women's officer. So, um, just yeah, you, know, you you effectively um, no, um, nominate yourself to run, and you will um, sort of be the the person sort of. Um, bridging the students um in your particular area and like sort of the staff um so yeah so it's it i, I love my time um being on the um being on the the uh, being in the jcr sorry um and yeah everyone's super lovely super helpful and they're really uh, just a really good port of call um for any of your problems um yeah brilliant thank you Owen. laurie you had a hand up anything to add I'm only nominally on the JCR. I didn't know anything proper, obviously being just the bar committee, but it, um, I think the general feeling around the Cambridge Student Union as a whole tends to be that it doesn't very, doesn't really do much. Whereas the college JCRs, and I think, I hope it's the same for all other colleges, but for Sydney it definitely is, where the, the JCR very much does represent the student body, partly because it's got so many different offices that it makes up a sizable chunk of the student body in itself. And they, have regular meetings with the heads of college, like the, um, the master of college, the senior tutor, for example, and all the DOSs. And um, they have a lot of influence over how the college is run. If there's any form of you know, injustice or exploitation of certain things, or if, um, if you've got a certain supervisor who's pressing on you to do certain work and you just don't feel like you can do it, the JCR are always happy to stand behind you and say, and support you and I guess in the same vein they're able to offer um, certain financial um, if you're financially struggling rather they're able to offer certain hardship funds and if you want to run a society they can give funding for that but yeah, their job is very much just to support the student body as the college does but we're on the behalf of the students instead of the college as a whole. Thanks Laurie that's really helpful um, yeah, because the JCR, I think they do a lot of really good work. And I, again, it's one of those things that before you're a student, you don't really know that these things exist. So I think it's really useful to have that exp explained. Um, another thing, we've had a question about um, what do porters do, which is a great question um, because not many places have porters. Um, so does anyone want to to answer the question of what do porters do? <laughs> Has anyone had any good interactions with the porters at Sydney? Go for a bag. <laughs> they do a lot of things. Um, they'll give you replacement keys, spare keys, if you lock yourself out of your room, like I have done on many occasions. Um, they're kind of always there if, if there's a problem. Um, they're always in the porter's lodge, which is right at the front of college. So you can contact them. You can just walk in or you could give them a call. Um, and they're always just a friendly face around college. They're always there to help. Emma? Yeah, I mean, I think the main interactions I've had with Porter so far are picking up keys and dropping up keys at the end, picking up parcels, they deal with all your posts, um, and, you know, calling them to get them to open the gate for when my dad comes to pick me up, and they're just kind of, like, there. <laughs> there are people who are there that you can go to for, like, accommodation-y type things and stuff around college. Nice. Thanks. Succinct. Useful. Um, cool. So we've also had um, another somewhat tricky question to answer, which is, are you treated like adults? I assume this means do your tutors or do uh, your supervisors, how do they treat you? Like, what are your interactions like? Do you feel like you're treated as adults or does it still feel a bit like you're at school? A very tricky question, but anyone want to go? Go for it, Laurie. I definitely think we are, and I feel like we are probably more than other universities, and that come that can come in many different ways. Almost like you can um, 
for example, if you're slightly behind on your work, you meet your supervisor and you say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to have enough time to complete this essay for you by tomorrow. They'll just, they'll probably reply back with something like, oh, don't worry about it. Then we'll just, you know, try your best and then we'll have a conversation about it in the supervision. Or they'll say, oh, do an essay plan instead. That'll be fine. And there's a lot of leeway in that you're very much left to your own devices, which can feel a bit scary at first because you're expected to go find all your resources. You're expected to know how to use them. But the compensation for that is at the same time, if you don't know how to do something, they'll help you out. But if you do know how to do something, they won't patronise you and make you go to special classes for it or whatever. It, they only offer help if you want it or need it. And it seems that they are happy to the responsibility of asking for help fall on your shoulders, which can be a good and a bad thing, I suppose. Indeed. Anyone else? Okay, cool. Um, well, we've got about 10 minutes left and uh, there are a couple of, sort of classic questions left in the in the bank um, which kind of fit together quite nicely uh, one is what's the best and what's the worst aspect of Sydney Sussex and the other one is if you could change one thing about the college what would it be so I think we can roll these together maybe we'll do what is the best part of, aspect of Sydney Sussex and then what would you change if you could change one thing um, you could answer both if you want, or you can answer just one of those, but uh, let's try and get something from, from everyone on this. Um, but raise your hand if you want to go first. You can't all say Sainsbury's either, by the way. Uh, Ruby, you were there first. Um, I guess the best thing is probably the people and maybe also the gardens as well. I, especially with the summer, I spent a lot of time in the gardens. Maybe something I'd change or the worst thing. I don't, um, it'd be nice if it was by the river. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that'd be quite nice. Good answer. Emma? I mean, I think Ruby just stole my answer about the best thing. Like, the only, that was the answer I could think of. The best thing being the people, because when I think what I think of as being college and what makes it great is just like my friends and the fact that they're there um and the bar I like the bar um and then when it comes to things I would change I can only think of like really petty things like I room had um coat hooks um because I don't have enough of them and I had to use my because last year I didn't have a towel rack and so I bought a towel rack and so this year I did have a towel rack but I didn't have coat hooks so my towel rack became my coat hook um and that's why I changed <laughs> I'll make a note of that one. That's a really useful. <laughs> um, um, okay, uh, good. Anyone else got anything to add about best features, things to change? Go for it, Owen. This is pretty niche just because I do quite a lot of dance, but some of the colleges have like a dance studio um, on their grounds. So I think that's something I would change just to save me the time from going to different colleges to practice there. That's why I would change. I mean, that is a really good one. Um, it's worth pointing out, like all of the colleges do have quite a variety of different um, uh, facilities and things. Like one of the colleges has a pool, one of the colleges has a theater. Sydney has a gym, uh, you know, like there's, there's, look, there are different facilities at different things. Um, so yeah, that's a good way to, to sort of pick between them, I suppose, is to look, to look through the different facilities they have. Um, some are by the river, as Ruby says, you know. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, cool. If we haven't got any other things to add to that, someone's asked about um, finding local part-time work. Does anyone want to tackle that? Laurie, go for it. Um, officially, the rule within Cambridge tends to be you're not allowed to find part-time work outside of the university, which is a very cleverly worded rule, which means that when it comes to stuff within college, there's quite a lot of stuff you can do. Um, so, for example, with Stuart, for example, you can do a lot of access work on sort of open days and working around interviews, and that gets paid for, and you can have, um, well, the student bar is the main one, so Sydney Bar pays, like, there are always shifts available at Sydney Bar for anyone who wants them. You don't need any specific qualifications. You don't need to go through any tests. You just sign up at the beginning of the year. And 
most colleges don't even have that. So that's a big advantage of Sydney as well. Oh, yeah, and I've got anything to add. Um, so this isn't, I actually no, I guess it is a part-time job, but um, the uni, um, I think actually through Sydney as well, uh, offers like tutoring as well, that is paid for. So um, you can definitely look into that as well. Um, I do it via the uni as well as like outside. So there's definitely opportunities to make money, I would say. Yeah. It's also worth remembering there's, um, there's things like uh, internships and things uh, that you can you can do in the holidays and other times um, and because the terms are quite short at Cambridge you get quite a long holiday to work as well so there are ways around that. Emma anything to add? Oh just a tiny thing about money about like the idea of the part-time jobs I think Cambridge like has the thing you don't really have time in term to have much of a part-time job which is why they have that rule um, but I think on, on the other hand as Stuart said there is uh, the long summer and things like that to do work then and I also think that Cambridge in general is quite good at lots of bursaries and things like that um, and also just one thing that I found is that when I was coming to uni I was a bit worried that I might have to do part-time jobs or I might have to find something over Christmas um, because I saw a figure website about how much it costs to live in Cambridge and I just didn't find that at all um, I found that like the stuff that I had from student loans and like what would have been a full student loan because I'm lucky and my parents topped me up was like fine plenty I didn't need that but other people have different experiences but I think Cambridge is okay. Thank you Emma that's really useful yeah it's worth pointing out yeah there are um a wide variety of, of uh, financial support schemes as well in place at Cambridge to make sure that students are supported um, throughout their time here. The Cambridge Bursary um, is, is a very uh, generous bursary that, that you claim throughout your time at Cambridge. It is a means-tested bursary. Um, in the chat, uh, Sophie, our admissions uh, assistant, has just placed um, uh, a link to this and a bunch of other things. So if you want to find out some more information on this stuff, you can find links in the chat. Um, excellent. Uh, on the back of that, would you say, how, how expensive have you found Cambridge? Because that's a pretty big one we get. Like there is this, this idea that Cambridge is an expensive university to study at. Would you guys agree with that? Or do you have different experiences like um, in terms of accommodation costs or anything else? Emma and then Beck. I mean, I think just in terms of accommodation costs, when I was doing my university research, um, because Cambridge has such short term um, and uh, whenever you, and there's college owned accommodation that you can stay at for all three years if you want I think accommodation costs are the lowest of all the universities that I was looking at because just you not staying there for many weeks in a year and it's all college owned accommodation so they're setting the price so they can make it a reasonable price. Yeah, I was pretty much just going to say what Emma has just said there. I think with different unis, if you're renting privately, you obviously have to pay for the accommodation throughout the year. Whereas at, at Sydney and at, at Cambridge, you only pay for the time that you're there, or at least that is how it works at Sydney. So you would only be renting for, say, nine weeks or 10 weeks um, at a time. Um, so you don't have to pay for the full the full year, which I think brings the cost down. Cool. Thanks, Beck um okay another sort of question off the back of what we were talking about earlier what is there to actually do in Cambridge <laughs> as, in, as in is the city a fun place to be um because again we, we've talked a lot about the, the the university and the clubs and societies and things like this um but do you guys have anything to do with the wider city does anyone want to start us on that go for it Beck. I think there's lots of nice walks to do with very friendly cows. That's one of the, my favourite things to do during the day. Um, you can go punting. Um, there's a cinema a little bit further out if, you know, after term's finished, if you want to go to the cinema um, or bowling, there are things around. Um, but for me, it's mainly walking, walking along the river and going for nice, nice strolls. That's what I enjoy doing. Any other things to say about Cambridge as a city? <laughs> 
I realize some of you haven't been here much, especially Laurie and Ruby, it's first year, so you might not have been in Cambridge Huge Man. Uh, Emma, and then Ruby? I mean, yeah, I think if you look for it, there's lots of things you can do. I mean, there's Grant Chester Meadows, which is a nice place to walk to, um, and there's lots of parks and things, and Jesus Green allows you to do barbecues and things like that. Um, and there's, like, there's the stuff that you can go to as a student at the uni, like the Botanical Gardens have free entry if you're a student, and there's the Fitzwilliam Museum as well. Um, and I know that in my first year, um, I went to, like, Mill Road had a whole Christmas fair, like, all along its length, and I went to that with some of my friends, and we went to, like, a carol service with some of the churches there. And there's lots of stuff to do if you look for it. Yeah, it's just a very nice city in general and also very flat. So it's it's very easy to walk everywhere. There's not really, I think there's only one big hill really in Cambridge. But other than that, it's just very nice to walk around. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, Cambridge is nice. There's always stuff going on in Cambridge. There's, I mean, there's so many students, but there's also so many like just there's people from all over in Cambridge. It's a nice place to be. Um, okay, we've got about two minutes left. So maybe to, to finish up, I think uh, a, a good kind of sign off would be um, if you could sum up Sydney in a sentence, in a few words, uh, how would you do it? Um, it's a, it's a, again, it's a tricky one to lob at you at the last minute, but, uh, but if you think of like a tagline, what would Sydney's tagline be? Beck, again, you're the hammers up first. <laughs> um, friendly, nice gardens and close to Sainsbury's. A career in marketing beckons. Um, <laughs> anyone else? Or are you leaving it with friendly, friendly Sainsbury's? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll get the communications team on it right away. Um, cool, well, we are pretty much out of time. So um, uh, we can we can leave it there. And we've actually answered all the questions, which is a remarkable feat. So uh, thank you very much to all of our student panelists. Uh, it's been really great having you answering these questions with such honesty and frankness. Um, so yeah, uh, you can now depart. You can say thank you, goodbye. Thank you from everyone in our audience. And uh, we're going to move on to our um, Arts, Humanities and Social Science DOS Q&A, which will be starting in about 30 seconds. But yeah, thank you to our students. And um, yeah, that was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. OK, so um, we are now moving on to uh, our next session, which is a Q&A session with our Directors of Studies in the arts, humanities and social sciences. Um, we are pretty much all here, but not quite at the moment. So I will, um, I will fill up some time with some more inane yammer for uh, a couple of seconds. Um, so to the people that have maybe just joined us, um, uh, you can ask us questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you do have any questions about anything to do with um, studying at Cambridge, uh, how study works, um, anything like that, direct questions about the admissions process, whatever it might be, please do enter them in the Q&A box below and uh, we will make sure we answer them all. Um, and uh, we will go from there. So I think we can introduce ourselves. I've already introduced myself earlier, so I won't bother doing it again. Um, but should we go alphabetically and introduce ourselves, which would mean we start with Bernard and go from there? Hi, I'm Bernard Fulder. I'm the Director of Studies in History, in History and Politics and History and Modern Languages. That's quite a mouthful. I've been at Sydney since 2007, uh, so I'm being told I'm significantly older than I look, which apparently is a good thing. Okay, Brett. You know. So I'm Brett Gray. I'm the Director of Studies in Theology, Religion and the Philosophy of Religion. Uh, I'm also the pastoral tutor and chaplain and have been at Sydney since uh, 2015. Okay, Martin. Am I, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, super, yeah, I'm Martin Parker Dixon. I'm director of studies in music, which is a very uh, small niche subject. Um, 
and we're very interested in interviewing you if you're uh, keen. And I've been at Sydney for three years. I'm an external DOS. I'm actually currently at a different college, Fitzwilliam College, where I'm a tutor. So I've got a teaching interest at Sydney and uh, I've also got a, a pastoral side to my teaching as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. And Rosalind, that was perfect timing. You, you came in just as we were doing introductions. So uh, if you'd just like to introduce yourself. I'm the external director of studies for Anglo-Saxon, North and Celtic, one of the smallest departments in the university, but one that has students scattered across all the colleges. Um, the part of ASNAC that I teach is actually Latin, uh, but I have an interest in Anglo-Saxon as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Rosalind. So that's our panel. Um, if you do have more questions, stick them in the Q&A box. But a very common question that, that we get to start with, which I think would be a good place to start, is what exactly is a DOS? What does a DOS do? What do they do for students? What's the day-to-day -day look like? Does anyone want to, to start us off on that? Feel free to either. Yeah, Martin, go for it. Yeah, there's no, I don't think there's a one size fits all to that. It's it's personal style to some extent. I, I think some a director of studies means someone that directs your studies. Uh, you, they may say, go over there and do something. Um, take directions like that. Uh, direction could be more um, invasive, as it were. Uh, where you could see your DOS quite regularly if you needed to. Uh, it does it does depend a bit on style. For the most part, the the basic functions are to uh, make sure checking you're taking the right papers and to arrange supervisions for the most part. But uh, in my experience, DOSes have a broader interest in you and how you're getting on. And they they are a little they can be a little bit like a line manager, I think, that they they do want something from you. Can I suggest a different metaphor, Martin? I, I mean, you're totally spot on with the, you know, it depends very much and there's a lot of personal style, but I have a 16 year old son who's crazy about sports, very much a footballer. And the one analogy that immediately springs to my mind is that of a fitness coach, it's our football team coach. So, you know, we do make things happen for you. You know, we can open doors, but we, we, are, demand, we are a demanding lot, but we do, essentially fight your corner when things get tough and we think you did everything you should do. And um, so, yes, we do sort out quite a lot of the academic problems for you, but we're also there to kick your ass if you're starting to slack and are starting to be impolite to people around us. So, so as with any good fitness coach, we, we are trying to bring out the best in you, but we can only do so if you trust us. So that's, you know, here is a taste of the personal style Martin was referring to. Yeah, I, I, I think I need to develop a bit of that, I think. Um, less carrot, more stick. But that does, I think you're right. Um, my personal style has evolved as Cambridge works on me too, uh, as the culture changes as well. But yes, there is somebody, there is a, there is a coaching aspect to that. I completely agree. I, I think Rosalind should go next. <laughs> Can I just toss, what, toss in one other thing that what I would say to my students, when they, especially when they're starting out, is that your DOS is there to answer all the questions that, you're, that you don't want to ask anybody else, all the idiot. C Cambridge has this way of assuming that it has lots of acronyms, short names for things, go to the EPQ to this. And I, I always say the DOS is the person you can, you can ask about those questions and not, not be afraid of being judged for not knowing. And we're also there for, you know, we're also there for the nice stuff and we're there to mentor. We are there to help you think how to get the best out of your degree. Um, you know, we're there to even talk to you about things like what after your degree. I frequently find myself talking to students about career prospects, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, uh, line manager, fitness coach, general advisor, mentor. It, it's a sort of amalgamation of all these things. And we often sometimes wind up teaching you a little bit as well. well that was, what an answer. I mean, everything from like the coach in Rocky to Virgil guiding you through the inferno. It's quite a, <laughs> quite a range of, of, uh, uh, of uh, analogies there. Um, good. Well, I mean, that can, that can kind of lead us on to the... Um, this common question about how do you make sure a student's work-life balance is right? 
because it's a question we get a lot from students. Like what, what, how does a, a history student make sure that they're not working too hard or that they're working hard enough? Or how does a music student make sure they do that? Um, have you guys got any thoughts or advice on, on the work-life balance at, uh, at Cambridge? It's a, it's a good question, but as Martin said earlier on, it's very much down to individual choices and individual style. So, uh, you know, I have encountered students who try to get by with as little as 15 hours work a week. And there the DOS stick element came in and, and some reality check and a sort of adjustment of aspirations and the as it were, responsibilities that come with the privilege of a Cambridge education. I've also had students who've worked almost 70 hours a week and who needed, as it were, support that they, they shouldn't overcompensate for the anxieties and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and their actual desire to do as well as possible. They need, they need it reigning in and needed uh, their, their self-confidence nurtured that, uh, that they could get away with significantly less hours. Um, my rule of thumb is uh, university life is not unlike a normal job. You should be working around 40 hours a week. That includes lectures and, and seminars and supervision, etc. But if you're doing significantly less than that, you will be in for a surprise when you leave university. And you will also not be doing as well as a lot of very bright people around you for, who realize that you need to put in a certain amount. Everything else is down to individual talents and, and sort of, you, you, you know, your DOS is there to say you may be working too much. Um, and some students are happy working 55 hours and they don't feel as it were exhausted by it. And if that works for them, then fine. I would never as DOS recommend you do that unless you feel happy doing so. Um, if you're sort of 20 to 25 hours a week and feel happy, I will need to destroy that happiness and say, you know, your work-life balance is currently out of kilter. Can, can I also just chip in and say, um, if, if you're working a lot more than say 48 hours a week on average, you know, uh, I, there's probably something wrong with how you're working. You're probably working less effectively than you think you should, than you should be. And, and part of the, you know, the role of the DOS is helping you to look at how to work effectively. Um, you know, there is a diminishing return if you're putting in that many hours. You're not going to be getting the same out. And, you know, we'd want to explore with you what's going on there. Yeah, I'd like to throw in some historical perspective. Sydney's, uh, perhaps some historians amongst us will uh, correct me, but I believe there's a sort of Puritan culture at Sydney. So I think having fun is is wholly to be frowned upon at all times. So if you're miserable, you're probably doing it right at Sydney. But um, joking apart as music DOS, music, of course, mo music means entertainment and fun for the most part. And one of the quite difficult things for me is to stop musicians doing music, uh, or make, do less of it. There's an enormous amount in, in terms of uh, extracurricular activity at Cambridge, and it's it's made it's made people's careers for goodness sakes uh, actors and musicians have um really pushed on at cambridge and got somewhere uh by not doing their degree and doing other things so that's always there and i uh, as dos i would never i would never tell you not to go and uh, participate in footlights productions which some of my students have and you should stay in and do your essays it's a very very tough call um and it's, this comes down to the, the, the moral character of, of the student to some extent and what they're prepared to risk. Um, sacrifices sometimes have to be made and a DOS will, I, in my, I, I would never say to a student, you, you must stay in and read rather than go and perform in a show. But there is a limit, there is a limit. Um, and you, we are a world-class institution and we expect very, very high performance, mostly but not all the time. And, and plenty of uh, poor essays can be uh, brushed under the carpet and ignored and no one's going to lose any sleep over it. So I think being at Cambridge is walking that fine line between very, very high performance in whatever you've chosen to do and this opportunity to meet these people 
and do things that could change your life and have got nothing to do with subject or department or even college necessarily. So that's what's that's the sweet spot that I think we can provide. Um, brilliant. Well, we're talking a lot about what you do when you're at Cambridge, which probably answer the questions about how you get into Cambridge, because uh, they tend to be quite uh, common ones. Um, so what would you say a student does to stand out um, when it comes to an application? Uh, it's as, uh, as common a question as ever there, there, there is. Um, I mean, we can go by topic here, like what does a good history student look like? What does a good theology student look like? But how does a student stand out? Um, so I want to get started on that. I'm gonna, can I start with Rosalind, that? yeah, of course you can. Surprisingly, this sounds very obvious, but people can often distinguish them just by having taken the trouble to find out what the course is about, what it involves. I mean, we, we sound jolly nice. We're first in the alphabet in the, in, the, in the university handbook. And sometimes people suffice themselves with that. But actually checking out, going looking at our website, checking out what, what the course actually consists of, rather than having some generalized view of what, of what we stand for. And then following it up in some way. Go visit, you know, in normal times, go visit a museum, visit a place that's got some historical connections, chase up... Uh, some reading that's caught your attention on, on, on the web that, 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 you, that you can mention and talk about. That's all it takes, is to, is to embody your enthusiasm rather than just say that you're enthusiastic, show that you're enthusiastic. Um. Martin, were you trying to get in? Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, if I, um, I, 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 every year I frame it differently. This year I'm gonna try this, which is, if this was a job interview, essentially what the employer wants to know is, 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 in a sense, can you do the job? And the easiest way to ascertain that is to demonstrate that you are already doing the job. You have that experience, you're, you're in the zone and you've been getting on with it. And yet now you're going to carry on doing it here uh, with me, say. So one of, the, one of the things that's gonna make a student, an applicant stand out is that they bring this energy to say, yeah, I, I've been, I've been, I looked at this, I'm really interested in this little niche bit of repertory here. And I've been thinking this and I've read up about it. And I, I emailed someone, I met someone I, and I got some recordings together. And I go, right, you're doing, you're doing what we do. Um, you're researching the world, uh, a, a niche, a, a little bit of culture. You're researching it. You're interested in it. You're motivated, you're getting material together, you're forming views, you're balancing one view against another view. And you go, right, fine, you're in. That's that's all that's all we do. And we're going to carry on doing that. And also between ourselves, I kind of think that everyone wants to do a PhD. That's a bit weird, I know, but I think that we're just even at little at reception class in the primary school, I go, Do you want to do a PhD one day? Because let's get on with it. Let's just keep let's just keep going. Um I don't think the goal is necessarily getting to your first class honours in a bachelor's degree. I think we want to go beyond and keep learning and keep learning, whatever it might be. And there's something about the the energy a, 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 a sort of research disposition has, which is a curiosity, tireless curiosity to keep looking and keep, and also a very generous kind of mood as well. It's not I'm right, it's I'm interested and I want to know more. And that can last you your lifetime, I think. So if I see that, I'm very happy, I think. Go for it, Brett, sorry. I mean, I, I would just sum it up as demonstrable, informed passion. I want to know you're passionate about the subject. I mean, for my subject, for instance, you don't have to be religious to study religion, but I want to know that you're interested in it. I want to see that. I want to see that, that you're doing reading, you're finding out about things, you're exploring things. I don't even require you to do an RSA level to do, to do my subject, but I want to know you're reading, thinking, exploring that world already. So demonstrable, informed passion. Nice, might steal that dip. It's quite good. You can have that. <laughs> yeah. <at> this slide. <laughs> um, 
Excellent. Um, so, I mean, in practical terms, there's a question about interviews, which we'll get to in a minute, because that's a, a, a good a good topic to sort of milk this a bit more with. But if you're reading a personal statement, what kind of catches your eye? What stops you and think, okay, this 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 stands out from the 20 other personal statements I've just read? What kind of examples? Like, what can we take? Bernard, you're leaning forward. Well, I'm, I'm just leaning forward to it because I think it actually relates to the question about the interval and, and, the, and, the, and the knowledge that is required. Because I... Yeah. I think perhaps for those of um, our uh, viewers, participants who, who may wonder whether Cambridge is the place for them and whether they are outstanding enough to apply, what, what I would like to say is stop worrying about being outstanding. You know, the fact that you're tuned in here makes you perfectly, as it were, suitable to apply to Cambridge. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist. You don't, you know, a lot of people arrive whose self-confidence doesn't allow them to say, oh, I'm the outstanding one. So uh, the, the point about the personal statement, the knowledge that you bring along, we're not that interested in, uh, as it were, factual knowledge or anything. It's just that you need to be able to communicate your interest in the degree course, in the subject that you want to, dis, uh, to study and talk about it, even though obviously the interview situation is, is stressful, uh, in, in, in fact, for all involved, because we, we know how anxious you guys are when you apply. But you, you need to be able to uh, talk about the books that you said you read. Don't put anything in your personal statement that you wouldn't like to discuss with us. It just, just don't listen to any teachers who tell you you should be doing this or that. Because unless you do what you want, unless you do in that interview situation, not what someone told you to do in that situation, but what you feel comfortable with, you're probably not going to do terribly well. So we want as authentic, and I know this is a high, as it were, a difficult call, but we want a, as authentic an impression of you and your interest in this as possible, because uh, we genuinely are interested in your views. So, um, if you claim an interest in, in ancient Egypt and you put that in your personal statement, then it's not that we expect you to be the greatest expert on ancient Egypt, but we consider this a conversation starter. And if you then cannot communicate the sort of informed passion, the sort of cu intellectual curiosity that Brett Martin and Rosalind mentioned earlier on, then we wonder why you put it in in the first place. So it's not the factual knowledge you put in it. It's more like, um, you know, in history to be concrete, the first half, the first 10 minutes are devoted to your school history essay, where we are going to probe you on your factual knowledge on, on the stuff that school taught you. And we will push everyone slightly outside their comfort zone to see how they run with uh, difficult questions, we don't expect you to have answers, but know how to think about them or, or think out aloud. And, and then the second 10 minutes, we discuss your personal statements and all the conversation starters that you put in there. So don't put anything in there that you aren't interested in discussing. You can't predict questions that will come your way. And sometimes they may be, as it were, uh, unexpected, but always relating to the stuff that you put towards us. And um, so if you consider this to be an oral exam where you are expected to give the right answers, stop worrying. That's not how, that's not how it works in the interview. Go for it, Brent. And I'd also say, you know, people can get very head up about personal statements. And, you know, the open secret is some people have more support than others in writing those statements. And we're very aware of that. So I would never, as a DOS, make the personal statement the thing which decides an application. It's only ever for me a place to start, a jumping off point. Oh, you say you're interested in this. Let's talk about this. And again, looking for that demonstrable, informed passion and, and working with your, your, um, your personal statement to find that. But you know, it, it's that's not going to be the make or break thing. Your personal statement. It's it's more of a conversation starter. Yes, Rosalind. I completely agree with what Brett says about the personal statement. This particularly applies with ASNAC because there is no other degree in the UK that is like ASNAC. So, like as not, the personal statement will also be trying to cover, say, history or classics or English. And we're quite comfortable in ASNAC with, with a personal statement that doesn't mention us at all. 
<laughs> because we 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 sort of come in in the in the supplementary um, application form that that Cambridge sends when you can make a a personal statement there. So we're quite we're quite calm about a personal statement that doesn't look like it really suits us. That shows shows how it's it's absolutely just a conversation starter. Mm. So I mean, off the back of that, sorry, Martin, just no, before, no. just no. sticking with Rosalind. How does what does a an ASNAC interview use for to discuss then? If there's not much in in your personal statement, what 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 is the the fodder? Well, it. I mean, we, we would tend to use anything that that's mentioned in the the Cambridge supplementary statement. But we'd ask, what have you been reading? Have you visit? Where have you visited? What got what caught your interest to this subject in the first place? Uh, it, it might be that precisely not anything that's uh, that's that's specifically mentioned, but we might pick up on things that are mentioned in the personal statement if they're if they're at a tangent to ASNAC. If it's a personal mm. statement that's meant for for history degrees, otherwise there's plenty you can still pick up on um, in a, in an interview for ASNAC. Brilliant, thank you, Martin. Yes, uh, this is really interesting, very useful, actually. I, I agree that very much that the personal statement is not a deal breaker by any means. It's and if applicants treated this like a, a, um, a kind of checklist of things, right, I'm going to steer my interview panel to these kinds of things. That's not a bad use of it at all. Um, there are a few things that, that I see in uh, music uh, personal statements, which I, I, I will uh, let, me, let me be frank. I, I'm very tired of seeing them and they're not very useful. And I would steer people away from them. It's things like I love music. Is, is the problem with that is it's probably true everyone does but not everyone wants to come and do this terrible thing called study music so in a way i i wish the tripod was called musicology not music uh that's to say we're here to study it so we have to take up this stance towards this thing called music which is not uh orientated towards uh, enjoying it uh, but to working out what it what it is, how to do it, what it means, how to stop it happening, so forth. Um, so if there's anything in the personal statement which demonstrates dedication to study, then that's going to move the conversation in a profitable direction. Likewise, it, um, music applicants have probably done a lot of performance. They've been in, in orchestras and, and, and all of that's good. But... Um, it doesn't actually distinguish you very well from others and it doesn't bring um, there's not much to talk about there because most musicians play in orchestras at school. Now, how can you bring some sort of perspective to that? What did what do you think about uh, music making at school? Um, have you read anything about music education at the moment which uh, piques your interest? That would be a great way in for me. So can you. Uh, move the conversation onto a reflective, objective level rather than one of, of, of pleasure and enjoyment. That might be true of things like English as well. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, for Brett. Um, I don't, I mean, if we're staying on topic for issues around interviews as well, I know a number of humanities subjects do something that we also do, and that is we give you something you haven't seen before. Um, sometimes it'll be a poem. One year we gave our students a medieval map and a contemporary map side by side and said, oh, talk to us about the difference between these things. Um, might be a piece of philosophy, something unexpected. And one of the things we're also looking for in interviews is, can you take something you've never seen before, no one's prepared you to deal with, and begin to grapple with it, not to get it right, not to get the right answers, that's really important, but to see, can you be curious in a thoughtful way? Uh, because that's also what we're looking for in humanity subjects. We're never looking for the right answer. Well, I mean, mostly never looking for the right answer. We're looking for the way you think and engage with things. Yeah, I, I, I would just like to point out that in history, that is uh, absolutely true. So uh, in the two interviews that we have, uh, uh, each with a pair of interviews, one is dedicated to your school history essays that you send in uh, in advance. Uh, so that's the, that's the, as it were, the stuff where you are moving on, as it were, home ground, at least to some extent. The other interview exposes you to two historical sources, 
uh, uh, normally one more modern, the other uh, less modern, as it were, uh, much earlier in, in, in terms of period. But um, essentially, you will never, you, you, you don't stand a chance of actually knowing it. No one is meant to, it doesn't matter. It's more a way for the interviewers to see everyone singing from the same hymn sheet to uh, borrow an analogy from music. Um, and uh, I, I, I do think that um, uh, since you don't need to prepare for it, it's the one thing that you don't need to stress for. You know, you can't get wrong because you misguided your, your prep, uh, preparations. The, the thing that I would uh, just want to add to what my colleague said about the personal statement, Martin is of course right that lots of you are doing the same thing when applying for a certain subject like music or, or law, or, you know, but, but I, I think what does matter to us is that you use the personal statement, not just as a conversation starter, but also to give us an impression of who you are. We're not, we, we don't want to judge you on who you are, but if you are a passionate musician and you want to do history, then do let us know that you are a grade seven trombone player and that you're, you like jazz. Or if you have worked hard over the last five years uh, on your Duke of Edinburgh award, I don't care whether it's bronze, silver or gold, but it matters to you. And you probably did it not just to get into Cambridge, I hope. So, so you know, it's, you're not going to be asked on that, but if in the final five lines of your personal statement, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how it works with a word count, but I mean, that, that, those, if you put in stuff that matter to you, you simply give us an opportunity to, to get a more holistic uh, view of who you are. So, you know, if you are a competitive table tennis player about to participate in the Young Olympics and you manage to do all that uh, school stuff on the side, we can appreciate how much more difficult that may be than if you, if you don't mention anything and you just bring very good grades, as lots of you do. Lovely stuff. Thanks, everyone. Um, I mean, a very helpful question has just come in that, that goes on the back of this quite nicely. Um, how key of a role do admissions tests play in our applications? Uh, this applies, I think, only to Bernard and Brett here, I think. So do you want to talk about the admissions assessments that that uh, that applica applicants to history and, and theology would, would have? Beauty before age is what I would say. So off you go, Brett. Um, uh, are you saying I'm better looking than you or older than I, I'm confused here. But anyways, um, it's only one factor. I mean, one of the realities that we have to deal with is uh, with the end of AS levels, frequently the only hard data we have on you in terms of your academic performance is your GCSEs and predicted grades. Um, so we're looking for different ways to try to ascertain your capabilities. So um, it's never, it's just one piece of a puzzle for us. Um, we'll be looking at alongside your predicted grades, alongside your personal statement, alongside your GCSEs. And, um, you know, it, it it's, it's important, but it's actually not that important for us. It, it's just a piece of information. I would like to add to that. And again, on in, in terms of the general message here, uh, it very rarely uh, is a deal breaker. It, 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 it very rarely kicks people out. Very, very, very rarely indeed. So it can work to your advantage if, if you're doing really well. In the history, it's still something of an untested a bit of the admission process. We're still getting 